Okay. Um, this was actually the first accoutrement plate I ever found. It was back, I believe, in 1973. And all my buddies were ribbing me. They had dug box plates, and one of my buddies had dug a buckle, and I was just dying to dig a plate. And so I went out hunting by myself at a site, and um, actually, I had a premonition I was going to dig a plate at this site, but I was thinking I was going to dig a CSA. And I dreamed about that night a CSA rectangle. And so I went out the next day and started hunting this area and got a good signal and I kicked away the leaves and laying there just right under the leaves, I saw the back of a box plate sticking up. And I'm like, oh great, I've got me a beautiful box plate. It's got all the hooks on it. Wait till, wait till my buddy said he dug a U.S. last week, but he didn't have hooks on it. And then I flipped it over, and I found out it really beat a U.S. It was a Georgia State seal. And at that point, I quit hunting and took it to a, to a place in Kennesaw, and um, actually Wild Man Civil War surplus. I think everyone here is familiar with him, old-time relic digger, usually real theatrical. I took it to him, and he says, Whoo, what you got, what you got? And I said, this, and I held it out. And his whole persona changed. He said, oh, my God. And that's the only time I ever heard him talk normal in my life. And um, it turned out it was actually from a site he used to hunt. But the cool thing about this is, other than it being a Confederate plate and being the first one I ever dug, after I did the research, well, actually, Dent clued me in on it. He said, um, we found a Republican Blues button up there. The Republican Blues were a, a unit from Savannah, Georgia. And once I started researching them, I found out that they had been on garrison duty in Savannah. They were real wealthy citizens for the most part. Our joke was they sat around fishing and eating oysters for most of the war. Well, the powers that be decided it was time for them to go to experience real combat and see the elephant. So they sent them up to where this box plate was found, a few miles north of there actually in the camp. Where the box plate was found, was actually on a hillside that was a skirm, it was a picket line there, about a quarter mile in front of the lines at Gilgal Church. They put these fresh Georgia regiment that had these box plates and Republican Blues RB buttons that have never seen warfare before facing the entire Sherman's entire division coming through there. And as soon as they saw all the Yankees coming up the hill, these boys, they broke and ran. I mean, they skied out. And where I found this box plate, I found um, uh, maybe half a dozen infield bullets and a heel plate and um, actually found a, a block eye button not far away too. And I like to think in my mind that what happened, this guy was running down that hill. He tripped over the rocks. He fell. He lost most of the contents of his cartridge box, maybe even threw away the whole thing, lost his heel plate and kept going all the way back to the lines. But, um, you know, it's hard to be brave if you've been on garrison duty the whole war and all of a sudden you're facing Sherman's hardcore guys, you're going to run. And that's what this guy did. One of the relics that told the greatest story to me, I found an ID tag one time in a field hospital. And um, as a side note, at this field hospital, I also found down in the valley there a bunch of fired bullets and there wasn't any firing around there. I figured that's where they were throwing limbs or pulling out bullets, throwing them down the hill. But I found the ID tag and I researched the guy. I got his records, like you said. And um, he was a enlisted. He was 45 years old when he enlisted. So that's pretty old. Yeah. Um, he was enlisted as a corporal. He was, um, his occupation was, oh, I forgot. And I think it was something like, um, soldier or something that didn't make a lot of sense, you know. I found out later he was from a very wealthy family. But this soldier, when I got his records, he was captured at Cedar Mountain, um, and then suddenly he was listed, after he got exchanged, he was listed as AWOL. And for, I think, about six months, they said he was, you know, didn't report for duty. And finally, in the records, there appears this letter from his commander that's basically an apology, and it says, well, we found out that Ethel did not desert. He was actually uh, on hospital field duty. Well, obviously, if he went to field uh, hospital duty, 
they would have known where he was at. So I'm wondering, well, why did they have him listed AWOL? And then I did a little more detective work, and after that, his rank appears as private. So he got busted. And I'm thinking, well, but why this letter of apology? That doesn't make sense to someone. So I did a little more research, and I actually did a Google search on the internet. His father's name came up, I don't know how many thousands of times. He was a famous worldwide architect from Hartford, Connecticut who obviously was just loaded with money. And I still believe he basically paid off the authorities to um, to pardon his kid who was doing hospital field duty so he wouldn't have to go out there and be shot at. It was at Cheatham's Hill, Georgia, where I found it in a pretty bloody battle. Imagine that. And I think that's what the whole thing was. And to this day, I've looked for a picture of him. Because as rich as his family is, there had to be some pictures. Mm -hmm.